Welcome to another in the series of Outstanding Leaders, a project of the International College of Dentists USA section. This morning we are delighted to have Dr. Harold Slafkin, Director of the National Institute of Dental Research and Craniofacial Research, a name which has just been changed, Harold. Welcome. Thank you. We're delighted you've taken time, and I know your schedule is just exhausting, but we are really pleased that you've taken time to come out and share who you are and your ideas of what you feel about dentistry. Let's start right back at the beginning. Tell me about your, your early family, your childhood. Tell me about mom and dad and the influences that they had in your early life. I was fortunate to be the firstborn child of new immigrants that came to the United States from Eastern Europe. And so I was um, infused with um, more love than a child deserves with the expectation of new immigrants that their firstborn American child can do anything that he would like. And in our family configuration, which was living in Chicago, um, I was the only grandchild and the only um, nephew for five years until my competition was born. So during the first five years of my life uh, living in Chicago, it was lots of time in the park and the museums and, and the beach. And the world from my vantage point, uh, looking through my eyes, was very beautiful and very loving. Unbeknownst to me, there was a thing called the Depression going on and the advent of World War II and all that went with World War II. But from the eyes of a child, it was all about love and building confidence and those kinds of issues. Um, after the war, my, my parents moved to California, and I ended up spending most of my life in California. Uh, and it became the going to school and, and uh, being um, nurtured to be a sort of renaissance-like. My parents felt that at the end of the line, I would have three choices, that I could be anything in the world that I would like, as long as it was, it was a physician, a lawyer, or a dentist. That was, from my parents' point of view, the, 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 the def, that, those were the parameters uh, that, that I had. Uh, but um, I should know Latin. Um, I should uh, have some religious training. Uh, I should go to art school. Uh, I should be involved in liberal arts kinds of education. So they really provided me um, directly and indirectly with a very uh, rich beginning. Now you say you were the firstborn. Brothers and sisters are? Uh, seven years later, uh, a little, a little baby came along named Leslie, my sister, my, and the only other child in, in our family. Uh, and, but the, the amount of time between us was such that I went through life and she was this adoring, lovely little thing, but, but sort of a plaything. Now as adults, we have a wonderful adult relationship, but as children, we really lived in two different worlds. Okay. And, and your father's uh, profession? Uh... He was, um, uh, his interest was uh, chemistry and then went into pharmacy. And he was a pharmacist uh, in, uh, uh, in Chicago working for Walgreen Drugstore and ending up managing one of their, one of their uh, stores uh, near the University of Chicago on the south side of, uh, of Chicago. And my mom was an uh, intensive care registered nurse, an RN, who um, found life very exciting in a um, uh, intensive care environment. Uh, and uh, both of them loved uh, being part of health professions. Uh, but both of them felt that I shouldn't be a nurse. And my dad was very insistent that, I should, that a pharmacy was not an option. It remained medicine, dentistry, or law. And you, so your mm -hmm. mom was also in a professional yes. lady. And um, did your sister follow in any of those just for? Uh... No, uh, my sister ended up uh, becoming someone interested in education and became a counselor in a, in a college in, in Southern California, uh, involved in guiding young people into careers uh, and, and, and working in one of our um, sort of a junior college-like setting in Los Angeles. Through those early years then, 
Uh, did you have any uh, feeling or any mentors other than, say, mom and dad? Or uh, when you went through up toward high school, uh, what Wait, do you remember about those days? The, um, um, I was one of those kind of kids where school came too easy. And um, I would end up directing my energy to things that didn't come easy. For example, in high school, I decided that um, I went to a high school in Los Angeles called Alexander Hamilton High School, and that no one had volunteered to run the 880 on the track team. And I decided in a foolish moment <laughs> that I would be the track star, quote, for the 880. And it was, it was one of the, it remains one of the most difficult things I have ever done in my life because at that time it was evolving from being a long distance run to becoming a sprint. And the first 440 I could handle. The second 440 was to die. Um, so I gravitated to things like that. Um, I played on the basketball team, so the coaches, the track team, a uh, coach was 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 very uh, instrumental. Uh, the um, uh, the basketball coach, uh, 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 Mr. Haskell, was very um, very influential, uh, and the various teachers, the science teachers, math teachers, art teachers, um, I think all took an interest and uh, and and provided some guidance. But uh, at the end of all of that, for some strange emotional reasons, rather than going out of college and going directly to a university, which is, was my mother and father's um, prescribed pathway, I decided to, um, to be a rebel and, uh, quote, run away from home, meaning join the army. And I enlisted uh, into the army. And they sent me to Fort Sam Houston and then to Walter Reed Hospital. And it was at Walter Reed Hospital that I became infatuated with dental research, with problems in the oral cavity, with prosthetic kinds of manipulations. And I just found it just very, very exciting. Now, from, from studying your biographic sketches, though, however, you went, got out of the Army after several years, and you went to college, but didn't take dentistry. You yes. have a degree in something else. Yes. Um, um, Mom and Dad and, and others in my life um, uh, suggested that if you want to be a physician, dentist, or lawyer, and at that time I clearly wanted to be a dentist, the, uh, the, the, the mentoring went something like this. First get a broad liberal arts education and then specialize in what you want to do professionally. So I gravitated into English literature and got my bachelor's in English literature. And to this day, uh, it was good coaching, uh, invaluable for, uh, for a different way of knowing the world, of appreciating poetry and fiction and nonfiction and the world of ideas and words and concepts. Um, uh, it was, it was a good, a good decision at the time, and uh, one that I rest on uh, very much in what I do today. And then it was on to dental school. Yes. At USC. Yes. What were those days like for you back in dental school? Um, were they positive? Well, the, 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 the USC School of Dentistry, like many schools of dentistry, uh, proclaimed that it was the finest school in the world. and. Um, um, and so, and it was at that time the only school in Los Angeles, and so it was clearly my, uh, my first choice. Uh, coming from a liberal arts four-year bachelor's degree experience and having been in the military for three years and being married, so I was coming into dental school with some degree of maturity, um, I found it abhorrent. Uh, the, the, the faculty, um, called us by numbers rather than by name at that time. I was number 82. Um, the, the pedagogy, or lack of pedagogy, was basically do it the way we do it um, without innovation creativity. And I found myself loving the substance of my education and rebelling against how it was being communicated. And I decided early on with a few other classmates that someday, somehow, we would try to make a difference. 
there was there had to be a better way of delivering the excitement and the and the creative opportunities and still have the rigor uh, of operative and restorative and all of the other aspects of dentistry especially at that time uh, but the um, uh, the mostly men who served on the faculty um, were pretty dominant figures and um, they were very gifted but they um, were not enlightened as educators. It's interesting I went to school in Ohio and it seemed like I must have <laughs> the same instructors. Now at following dental school at that point were they leading you to the research at all because your career has been primarily in research. Yes. At that point was there a feeling that that's where you wanted to end up or? Uh, at that time um, the research tract and, and that pathway um, did not exist. Uh, this was um, the world of 1961 to 1965. Um, the school had a set of fixed requirements and if you finished your requirements um, you could do electives. And so um, it became clear to me privately that that would be the name of the game. Um, I would try to finish my requirements through the junior year and have my senior year available to pursue something. And in tandem, on our faculty, we had a wonderful, wonderful biochemist named Lucian Bavetta at USC. And at that time, over at UCLA, which is eight miles away, a brand new dental school was being designed uh, with a new dean, a uh, gentleman named Radar Sognus, who was coming from Harvard and relocating at UCLA a uh, department of oral biology um, led by Richard Grulick and by hearing about that I wandered over and made contact and everyone I contacted were embracing about oh my god this is a live dental student who wants to go into research uh, how can we help you so um, they made it very easy to uh, um, work in a lab, um, give a paper at a meeting, write, a, a co-author a chapter in a book. Um, so I, I found myself, it became like, like Brownie in motion, um, a chairman of oral maxillofacial surgery, a guy named Marsh Robinson, gave me a project to work on called Amputation Aroma, teamed up with a couple of dental students and we worked on um, something called um, the pterygomandibular fossa and a novel way of, of anesthetizing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the um, a trigeminal ganglia. Uh, the, the, the work at UCLA was autoradiography, tracing amino acids and making enamel and dentine. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. This was like, it was fun. It was intellectually stimulating and it was part of being a dentist. So I, I got addicted and the addiction has not yet worn off. Uh, did you go then to do the fellowship with them? You did a fellowship immediately out of dental school. Yes, out of dental school, uh, 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 Dick Grulick uh, said, come on over and uh, we've got a program and take classes and get involved and so forth, which I, uh, I mean, it just seemed very, very straightforward. By that time, I was married, had two children, uh, and um, the stipend uh, at that time was, um, I think it was $5,000 a year. So because I was a dentist, um, I decided that I would fight um, tooth decay and periodontal disease in Westwood Village, which is in West Los Angeles, in a private dental office on Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, and Saturday while I got this additional training. I was ambivalent about whether I could succeed in a research environment. And I loved clinical dentistry, and so I would try to like run them in tandem, and then hopefully I could make a choice. So by the end of the first year at UCLA, Dick Grulick was recruited to leave Los Angeles, come to the NIDR at the time, and become the um, uh, director of the branch in biological sciences. So he moved to Bethesda, asked me to join him, uh, my family did not want to come to Bethesda at the time, so I then went to USC and joined Lucian Bavetta and continued postdoc training in biochemistry and continued part-time practice in Westwood Village uh, for three years. 
uh, then got uh, applied for and got something called a Research Career Development Award, which allows you five years to really develop your career and, and really ran with it. And uh, uh, then things started to gel. And seven years out of dental school, finally hung up my practice of clinical dentistry part-time and became truly full-time teacher, research person with a little administration. Was there a stop in London in, the, in, in that time frame? Um, yeah, I did, uh, did a sabbatical in, in London uh, and got some training at University College of London. Um, the, the, the style at that time was Lucian Bavetta as a mentor felt that I should um, network with people who were like-minded. So he arranged for me to meet uh, a man named Clifford Grobstein, who had been at the NIH in the Cancer Institute, then went to Stanford and developed a very rich developmental biology program, and then became the first dean of medicine at UC San Diego's medical school. And Cliff Grobstein was one of my, and remains, one of the heroes in my life. Loved the way he he talked, he walked, he thought, um, his style of research, a very, very um, talented and exciting individual. And in turn began to network with uh, somebody named Aaron Moscona at the University of Chicago, um, some people in Finland, in Helsinki, uh, Laurie Saxane and his team who were all interested in epithelial mesenchymal interactions in different systems and my thrilling journey was how can we do this for teeth? How can we make a tooth a model for answering world-class problems in developmental biology? And I sought to find out who knows how to do this technique or this technique or this trick to, to develop the kind of collaborations that would allow, because it was clear that no one place had all of this under one roof, and that I would try to amalgamate, synthesize, hybridize um, different ways of knowing um, to solve some of these kind of problems. So, and it began to happen through publications and stuff like that. So your whole, your whole stream then in the research area that you had chosen was sort of craniofacial biology? Yes, to, yes. And, and then you, you did some pretty wonderful things as I read. Um, during your sort of career, within that film and started some new programs and did some wonderful things. And the thing that I like about you from Marshart Association is that your enthusiasm for it is very contagious. I thank you for that, <laughs> incidentally. But give us a, give us a sort of a, a litany of what happened in those years as you started teaching and then you came up with the first program and so forth. Uh, well, in the, the um um, the reflection may be useful to others. Um, I never had an office or a laboratory or a clinic in the dental school. I was always integrated into the whole university. So I was in the gerontology center or center for biological sciences or a, um, a center for craniofacial molecular biology. I was um, teaching in the graduate program in cellular and molecular biology. Um, I was involved with physicists, mathematicians, um, people interested in um, laser technology. And it was that kind of intellectual Brownian motion, which is so damn, it's hard to make it tangible, but it changes who you are and your capacity for taking risks. Um, it became sort of natural to say, let's put a program together with a, a very um, eclectic group of people who have in common, they're really good, talented people, and there's goodwill, and let's start a graduate program, or let's start a program project grant, or let's start a center program, and with the help of the NIH, um, always, and later the help of the National Science Foundation and private sector and a number of other funding revenues, it, it became clear that multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary approaches were more fun for me than everybody being a dentist card-carrying or everyone being a prosthodontist or everyone an orthodontist, that the, 
that the richness was the, 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 um, the integration. So physical chemistry, mathematics, computational biology, structural biology, uh, experimental embryology, uh, gene jockey kinds of stuff, all of that gamish made my day more fun. And uh, I think that's where some of my enthusiasm is derived. I love learning from other people and uh, being with people who think differently than I do um, sort of gave me this wonderful venue of being fresh, of being uh, connected with where the action was in areas outside of my own so-called expertise, which also over time became more competitive and larger and more diverse, but it gave a larger canvas to paint on rather than a restricted canvas. But you were uh, assigned, or I don't mean assigned, but you were uh, employed by the dental school. Yes, had, had uh, uh, joint appointments, uh, uh, usually uh, between a graduate program and the dental school. Um, later towards, uh, I, w I served at USC over a 27 year period of time. So in our discussion, I'm, um, I'm um, uh, sort of identifying some of the, the melodies. Uh, because the details, of course, are um, 27 years worth of, of details. But I taught in the medical school, I taught in the dental school, I taught in the pharmacy school, I taught in the undergraduate non-science curriculum called thematic options. Um, I thought, taught in the physics department, I taught in the math department. Um, so my, my university citizenship was um, one of feeling that I was part of the University of Southern California and a very real part of the School of Dentistry, but the university part ended up becoming larger and larger proportionally, and the opportunities were often found on the other side of the wall of the School of Dentistry in collaborations rather than within the School of Dentistry. So for example, um, in 1990-91, myself, my wife, the dean of the School of Education um, at the university, uh, the National Science Foundation, the um, Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, one of the largest in the world, um, formed a consortium to focus on science and math education in preschool K-6 education in which we would empower elementary school teachers to be able to model the new thinking in science. And this was coming out of the School of Dentistry, I mean, in terms of the energy and the idea. And the grant, when it came, became a grant that was shared by, from the National Science Foundation. It was shared by the School of Dentistry and the School of Education. It made the university feel um, uh, good because it was an example of a private university in an inner city, in an urban setting, trying to do something to increase science and math literacy um, in a very complicated culture called Los Angeles. The dental school could use it as a wonderful example of outreach and changing the stereotypes. Uh, the School of Ed loved it. It was a whole new revenue stream. The school of edu the, the, the Los Angeles Unified School District, they loved it because there was this infusion of university smart physicists, mathematicians, chemists, people from the medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, nursing school, all saying, we want to help and we want to be part of your, of your program. Uh, we started it and it's still going on. It's a very, very exciting program, but it's out of the stereotype when we typical, typically think of dental science, dental education, dental practice. Um, I think that's one of the, 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 the important ideas. We can do all kinds of things. It's still being a dentist, but it's a dentist in a cultural context, not necessarily only in an office or focusing on, on delivery of health care to a particular um, patient population. It's about promoting health and preventing disease and, and literacy and the issues that in Los Angeles are very pressing issues. And we felt we were part of the community. 
and we still did our research and we still taught and we did all, so this was in addition to days longer, weeks longer, vacation time less, but what a high, what a rich experience. Let's change uh, directions just a tad because you've, you've mentioned your wife and I know that her interests are really in education yes. uh, from the K to 6 to 12. Uh, tell me about your family now. Let's, let's change yeah. direction and we'll come back to dentistry, but let me hear about Harold Slafkin's group. Okay, well, um, uh, Lois Slafkin, my wife, is, is clearly my, my, my best friend. Um, and somebody I um, unconditionally respect and adore and is, is just a great human being. She has a master's degree from UCLA in, um, in architecture and urban planning and got infected with urban planning in the context of early prenatal care, early childhood development, school readiness, and science and math literacy. Um, between the two of us, we have four children. Um, on my side, two boys, uh, Mark and Todd. Uh, and on her side, uh, a son and a daughter, Michael and Tracy. Um, all have evolved into fantastic human beings. Um, Mark ended up um, becoming a politician and becoming the president of the Los Angeles Unified School Board in Los Angeles. Uh, at the age of 28 was elected, um, representing a base of a million plus people with a budget of almost five billion dollars a year in a school district that serves 630,000 students a year. So he's had quite an adventure and he's also the father of three children that means three grandchildren uh, for us. Uh, a son, Todd, who's a film writer in Hollywood, and he and his wife, Tolly, have uh, a new baby, a uh, grandchild named Maya, and um, uh, he is doing beautifully in the uh, world of theater arts and creative writing. Michael and his wife, Anne, uh, have a new child named Ryan, who is this beautiful new entry. Uh, Michael has a computer programming company in Los Angeles. Uh, Anne is a research uh, librarian for Sony Pictures. Uh, very, very creative uh, couple. Uh, and then finally, Tracy and David live in Eugene, Oregon. David is a stockbroker, and Tracy's education was in early childhood development, Head Start kind of teaching. And they have a brand new baby that came two weeks ago. Uh, this beautiful little brook. So um, we're happy campers, um, uh, a family that we can't see enough of. They're 3,000 miles from us as we're living here in Bethesda. Um, and we just enjoy one another very much and, and, and share a lot of things in common. And they're all off the payroll. And they're all off That's the payroll. That's extremely important yes, to them. Yeah, they're all very successful kids. Yes. Let's take uh, just a short break here uh, for a second, and then we'll return and talk about some of the major issues as you see them in dentistry today. Great. After talking about your family, Harold, let's, let's now change total pace and get you to Bethesda. Realizing you had a wonderful 27 years in California, what, what led you to even apply for a job here that takes so much energy and so much commitment at the NIDR at that time? Go through those days and what your impressions were and why you did this. Let me um, embellish on that just, just for a moment. Picture this same deck. I'm sitting with my grandson whose name is Max and at the time, Max is 10 years old. And Max is looking me in the eye poignantly. He's got this wonderful big brown eyes and curly hair and just riveted into my face. And he said, Grandpa, go over this one more time. You're taking a significant cut in your salary. You're going to live, my dad tells me, in a swamp. <laughs> uh, you're going to work in a system that is very, very difficult and, you know, from, the, from, from whatever he was fed. And you're leaving a tenured position, a research program, your friends, your family, and me. Why are you doing this, Grandpa? And that scene really took place and was a very, very difficult 
time in my life to translate this to Max uh, and to myself. Um, in the early 1990s, funding for the NIH was getting increasingly difficult. Um, the relationship between the NIH and Congress was, was, was very tense. Uh, a number of things were going on at the NIH which were floating rumors that they were going to close down the Dental Institute. Harold Liu was the director. Um, um, Dushanka Kleinman was part of his team at that time. Uh, Bernadine Healy was the director of the NIH. And there was a vortex going on which was, um, which was um, very strained. As somebody who had been supported by the NIH for 27 years, who had been back and forth to Bethesda serving on committees and all of these kinds of activities, and I worked at the NIH as a visiting scientist from 1974 to 1975. Um, the NIH, and in particular the Dental Institute, was just part of me. I mean, this was, this was like if they closed down the Dental Institute, this would be like you know cutting off your arms or something. I mean, this was like, like horrific um, uh, uh, activity. So, and at that time, uh, I was being courted for uh, deanships in a couple of places, and uh, uh, one of the places that I looked at seriously was UC San Francisco and, um, and, and, and went through a process there. Uh, and then decided when Harold Liu resigned and I was called by Paul Goldhaber, um, who was on the search committee, uh, would you consider applying? And a number of people said, you know, you, you are probably the right person because Harold Varmus is now the director. It's got a lot to do with molecular biology and genetics. Um, the stakes seem to be pretty high. Um, you really need to take this seriously. So um, uh, I sat down with my best friend, Lois, and uh, we spent a long weekend uh, sort of reflecting and decided that let's, let's apply and, and, and pursue this. So went through the, filled out the applications and went for the interviews and so forth and um, um, in a field of some very, very talented people who were also interested in the position. And uh, when, when I got a phone call from Harold Varmus, maybe end of January of 1995, uh, I said yes, um, I would love to come back and uh, got on a plane and went back and made some final negotiations including I would not only come back to be the director of then NIDR, but I also want to continue doing research. And he said, we'll find you a laboratory situation in one of the other institutes, so there would be no conflict of interest. And it became, uh, I, I became nested in the National Institute of Arthritis, Skeletal Muscular and Skin Disease, so-called NIAMS. So, uh, in uh, end of May, beginning of June, um, packing up our furniture, selling our house, taking a leave of absence from my university, and uh, moving to Bethesda, and began um, the, uh, the the experience, uh, the experience of my life, uh, being uh, the director of of this institute, and uh, and the responsibilities that that go with it. In the meantime, of course, you had been the president of the, of the American Association of Dental Research and yes. all those other... Uh, yeah, I had had um, uh, the various uh, honorary degrees from, from Georgetown and later from University of Maryland and University of Paris. Um, I had done sabbaticals in various places in the world, and, you know, I ha and, I, and I had a tenured chair at the university, and, and I was funded for another five years on center grants, program project grants, had a merit award and an endowed chair, all of those kinds of things. So, I mean, it, it was very nice to come back from a position of uh, accomplishment, uh, but to take on perhaps the hardest job in the world. Uh, this was... Um, clearly moving into uh, an agency that was approaching its 50th anniversary, that had had a beautiful track record in, in efforts to reduce the burden of disease for, for, for dental caries and for periodontal disease. But other parts of its program were less appreciated by 
key decision makers, head and neck cancer, birth defects, management of chronic pain, um, the fundamental science of uh, extracellular matrix biology, biomineralization, I mean, just salivary gland, salivary gland dysfunctions. There was a whole host of things that were less marketed or, or not marketed effectively to really show the full panorama of what the Institute was all about. So I uh, came back with a lot of excitement, with the understanding with my new boss being Harold Varmus that um, we would do everything possible to keep the NIH together because we felt it was an endangered activity. After being there for one month, there was a hiring freeze. After being there for three months, there was a government shutdown, um, a, a two-week shutdown. After being there another month, there was another shutdown, another three weeks, and I was privately saying, wait a minute, I'm coming from Los Angeles, I understand earthquakes, I understand uh, uh, drive-by shootings, I understand pestilence, I understand, and I can deal with all of that, but what in the hell is going on here? I mean, this was, this was really bizarre. I, I mean, I, I truly felt kind of Alice in Wonderland uh, uh, thinking. Uh, but we started planning, planning for either stability or growth. Um, started a, a strategic planning process, classical audit. Um, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are the opportunities? Um, uh, wh what might be the uh, internal and external threats that might, uh, might be uh, involved? Um, enlisted hundreds and hundreds of people. And it became clear we needed to um, really change the emphasis integrate with the larger biomedical research community, change the name of the institute, uh, do some different kinds of recruiting, and really stimulate a whole new kind of modern biology meets the 21st century. From my kind of background and my pers personality, this was like a kid in a candy store. It was sort of like, this is really incredible. So starting with the savior by Mr. John Porter and Mr. Mark Hatfield, Hatfield in the Senate and Porter in the House, these two valiant heroes for the NIH saved our budget, pulled it out of the morass that was going on and uh, gave uh, some wind for our sales and we began to plan for some kind of incremental growth going into, into the future. And as you and I are sitting here today, we've grown by 60 some odd million dollars. Um, our program is very integrated into the NIH. Um, we are clearly not an endangered uh, institute. And um, it's very, it's a healthy, robust agency um, doing God's work and trying to make a difference. Just for uh, the people that will visualize this tape, give me an impression of of the extensive research uh, grant uh, programs and the extra moral programs. Uh, just a, a quick thumbnail sketch. So pe uh, it's just another opportunity to get people sure. knowledgeable sure. of what the NIDCR sure. does. The, um, um, there, the whole NIH is currently funded at about $15.5 billion a year. It's made up of 24 units called institutes, centers, or offices. Of the institutes, we are the third institute that was created in the history of the NIH. The first was cancer, the second was heart, and we were the third. So we've been around in the NIH system for a long time. We have an intramural program, which currently supports almost 400 scientists. We have an extramural uh, uh, division, which supports grants literally all over the world. We support grants in Africa, we support grants in Europe, we support grants to the World Health Organization, we support grants in Southeast Asia, in Canada, in, 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 in South America. We are global. Within the United States, everyone who works on craniofacial, oral, and dental diseases and disorders knows who we are and is likely receiving money either for the research or for the training of the next generation of scientists. We fund basic research, translational research, uh, patient-oriented research, community-based research, uh, health outcomes research. 
Um, we have a budget at the moment of uh, $234 million this year. We leverage probably another $30 million by um, collaborating with other agencies like CDC, uh, the, the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, for uh, agencies for uh, health services, a whole host of, of other uh, federal activities. Um, and, and, and those are exciting. Our portfolio focuses on everything that has to do with genes, inherited craniofacial disorders, oral facial trauma, infection and immunity, um, head and neck cancer, uh, biomimetics, tissue engineering, biomaterials, and then finally, the integration between behavior, the environment, and clinical research. That's our portfolio. Um, we need more resources. We have more opportunities than we can fund, um, unfortunately. Um, we are um, in a growth mode. We're looking for bright, wonderful, talented people who are either at the beginning of their careers or were interested in mid-career retraining to, to people to maybe retool and reinvent themselves and, and, and come back and become part of these activities. Um, this is the golden era of biomedical research in America. It has never been this good, ever. The amount of money that is available is the largest it's ever been. We have almost no inflation. The growth last year of 15% is, 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 is real dollars, not inflationary dollars. Um, the money is going to medical schools and dental schools and academic health centers and graduate programs. We're also investing in new industries, um, starting up small businesses through a, a, a percent of, of our appropriation. So we're interested in technology transfer from the bench to the marketplace. Very, very important part of what we're doing. Um, and I get to play this game every day. I get it's the best job in the world. I get to think about policy. I get to work with brilliant people. I get to listen. I get to, to communicate. I get to write. Um, uh, I'm writing a monthly article for JADA, the Journal of the American Dental Association, of, of the excitement of science and dentistry and all that it can be. Um, commencement addresses, uh, outreach efforts, community programs. Uh, it's a lot in terms of uh, the physical price, but emotionally it is so satisfying, and I, I, I love it. Well, we've talked about you as a grandfather. We've talked about you as a professor. We've talked about you as an editorialist, and of course you've written hundreds of articles and books and so forth. Let's talk about you as a futurist now. Where is dentistry going to be? to keep promoting the health as it has in the new millennium? The, um, the mantra that I like to use for myself is that American dentistry and dentistry found in selected parts of the rest of the world is phenomenal, comma, and it could be better. And it could be better means that every dental school for the future must educate the next generation to be very comfortable, very comfortable with the medical implications of oral infection, of the oral complications of medically compromised patients, of the gene therapy, of the, the human genome era that we are moving into. Uh, to using biomaterials, not artificial materials. Um, to be able to think of community care instead of in addition to individual care. Um, to be very proactive for all people need health and health includes um, mouth, saliva, oral mucosa, dentition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there isn't something called dental health, it is health. And I believe the future of our profession is further integration into the academic health center so that medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and the allied health professions and the schools of public health and the various schools of engineering and graduate programs all have some element of redundancy and reinforce one another. The needs of the American people in the 21st century are going to be different 
than ever before in the history of the world. Lifespan in 1900 was 45. It's now approaching 90. Lifespan has doubled in 100 years. This is a remarkable accomplishment quality of life expectations. You and I want to have all of our teeth, want to be completely robust, want to travel, want to engage our grandchildren and our children and our lifelong friends all over the world, want to be completely focused in terms of our quality of thinking and not have any diminishment, live to be 95 or 100 and die in our sleep. That's the real quality of life expectation of the two of us and most of the people we know in our uh, 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 social lives. To do that, it means better prenatal care, better, better early childhood development, better school readiness, better health literacy, science literacy, math literacy, better university training, better uh, professional schools, and not a fanciful but an imperative lifelong learning. The half-life of the knowledge base of somebody graduating from an American medical or dental school is probably going to be five years. The rate of discovery, the rate of literature, the internet, the explosion of opportunities of necessity means to, to say change is a given, not only external change but internal change. I need to revisit my assumptions on a regular basis, revise my thinking with new stimulation on a regular basis if I'm going to be contemporary for the rest of my life. If I don't do that as a nation, I can't be in a global economy. And if I don't do that as an individual, I'm going to feel marginalized and I'm going to feel incompetent with the way these things are going. The demands on change are not going to diminish. They're going to increase. And people who don't embrace change as a positive are going to be woefully disappointed with the world that they find themselves in. So I am um, um, excited about carrying this message into every hamlet that's possible to kids in elementary school and high school kids, college kids, and so forth because this is an accurate portrayal of the near future. We're going to live longer. The definition of work is going to change. The definition of communication is going to change. Print media, video media, internet media, all going through rapid changes. How we acquire information, very different. The models of, of learning, very, very different, rapidly changing. And I think the profession of dentistry has an incredible opportunity to not only be part of this, but be at the front end of this, to be known as the profession that seizes opportunity and runs with them, not a profession that is dragged into the 21st century, but one that jogs into the 21st century. Well, I applaud you, Harold, for all the energy you're expecting uh, or expounding to to go to every place that invites you. I hear that you don't say no very often, and that certainly is tough physically, but dentists are individual characters sometimes that are hard to, to change. You know, it sometimes becomes a pocketbook issue over the corner drugstore. And I applaud you for what you're trying to do through the JADA things, through all of the lectures that you do, and by all means, you gotta keep it up. Some of us are not the ones that you're gonna impact, but the the young kids, and the brightness of dentistry as a future has got to be exciting, and I can see it in your eyes, and I know I listen to you say that. If a young man came up to you and said, Doctor, would you go into dentistry today? What would you tell him? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the opportunities, um, you know, from, from my point of view, I want to be about the human face. Uh, I want to be a doctor that really deals with the human face. Um, um, the quality of a smile, um, the quality of communication, the quality of all of the sensory apparatus. I want to keep you healthy in terms of, of the bone and the connective tissue and all of those sorts of activities. I mean, the human face is the opportunity for the future of dentistry. Instead of dentistry focusing on a tooth or a cluster of teeth, just 
pull back a few steps and look at this incredible thing called the human face, reading the internal aspects of people. Um, all of our neurosensory connectors to the central nervous system are all packaged right here. We hear, we see, we taste, we smell, uh, we, 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 we uh, feel pressure, uh, temperature, touch. All of that is connected here. So all of the quality of life expectations, uh, a smile for a lifetime, um, facing the 21st century, um, a face or window into systemic disease, uh, diagnostics using saliva to monitor the rest of the body, uh, being comfortable with dealing with the orthopedic community, the dermatology, the neurology, all of the other specialties comfortably. Um, I believe the future of this problem area is without boundaries. It is not going to fade unless, uh, as you and I well appreciate, unless we don't take advantage of these opportunities. And that is the challenge for people who are in the leadership of dentistry internationally and domestically. Um, our schools need to be integrated into academic health centers. Our faculty, by definition, should and must include nurses and pharmacists and physicians and, yes, dentists. Dental schools should not be all dentists and a couple of PhDs teaching the future for the 21st century. If 32 million people are over 65, and soon it'll be 42 million people over 65, the changing pattern of disease, the changing pattern of demographics, the changing health costs in this country all demand holistic, integrated health care better, faster, and cheaper for the 21st century. And I believe that better and cheaper can go together when we start using some of the new paradigms for community-based, population-based delivery of health care. Um, that will be a renaissance. So I think the future is just, you know, sparkling with opportunity. And what I pray for is that the leadership of our dental schools and our medical schools will find common ground where the vice presidents for academic health services will say, I want a broker bringing these academic units together where the town and gown relationship between alumni and the university is positive. Rather than alumni detracting from the university, build the university, make it more relevant, make it better. Uh, so everyone has great pride uh, instead of the dissension that sometimes exists in certain pockets in the country. This is a time to come together. This is a community opportunity. And if we work together, um, it's going to be uh, remarkable, just remarkable. Well, I personally am delighted that we have the person that can articulate that to all of our profession okay. because many of them need to hear it as we know and you're willing to go out and do all that for us and and that that's a that's a wonderful opportunity for you but it's really very important for the impact it has on us as, as clinicians and and the people that talk to the public the individual patient in the chair. Now, let me ask you this. We all have heard about what do you want on your grave? And I don't mean that in any manner means, but what, what do you want to most be remembered for? Uh, you, I know your grandchildren and your, and your, your sons and daughters. What, what is the thing that you feel is the most important impact that you've had in your life and uh, you would like somebody to... It's, oh, oh, of course, you can go more than three or four words but, uh, um, uh, that would fit on the stone. Tell me about that. I... It's a very, um, it's probably a very, very important question. Um, one, of the thing, one, of, one of the athletic things that I love is relay race where people run around the track, pass the baton, somebody else, and the magic of the relay race, whatever scale it is. I believe I'm in a relay race. I was handed a legacy from my parents, 
uh, from the previous directors of the institute, um, going back, you know, to uh, Trendley Dean and Pokey Arnold and uh, Cy Creshover, um, Dave Scott, and more recently Harold Liu, and basically the first issue is do no harm. And the second issue is leave the world better than you found it. And I think I have really incorporated that. And I think that's what I'm really all about. Um, in I, I, I want to, um, uh, if it's about being known, but for me it's more important internally what I know about myself. I want to have the integrity of my conviction that whatever I'm doing is to try to leave this human experience, if possible, better than I found it. And at the same time, do no harm. Uh, and um, I hope those who reflect on this Hal Slafkin odyssey uh, might make that same conclusion. So what do you got to do yet to, to follow into th those principles which are fantastic? Well, I don't know. The, uh, um, the, the understanding that all of us have who have been recruited by, by Harold Varmus is that we came back to do a job. Uh, we're on a loan from our universities uh, and that we will go back. So this is not a forever uh, retirement looking activity. And so my time will, will come to an end uh, in the near future probably. Um, then um, I really don't know. The, the, um, uh, I love dentistry and I love my children and grandchildren and I'm also very caught up with the disparity between the haves and have-nots of this country and thinking about you know teaching elementary school or working with very young people or um, you know all of those kinds of issues. I, uh, I, I don't want to walk in the same footsteps that I've been walking in. I'd like to, you know, sort of like a pristine, something a little bit different. And I'm not sure what it's going to be, but uh, it'll probably be different. And um, uh, I think whatever form it takes, um, it, it, it will be consistent with uh, trying to make a difference. Well, I would hope that your statement that is, this may end in the very near future is not a valid one. We want you to stay a long time because the impact that you've had on dentistry is just magnificent. Thank you. And I consider it an honor to sit here with you. Thank you. As you know, the, these tapes will be kept in the National Museum of Dentistry for all to see for years to come. And we certainly appreciate the time that you've taken. And I know how busy you are. I've sat in some of your council meetings and know that you're traveling extensively. And we in the college appreciate you not only being a fellow, but we appreciate you as what you're doing for our profession. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. And thank you for your dedication to make our better world. Harold, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Nice to be with you.